I'm glad to be with you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your time, for sharing your knowledge, your history of with bioenergetic analysis. So I will try to present myself um, in a short way. Uh, I started to um, uh, be trained in bioenergetic back in 1976. So that tells you something about the fact that I am uh, an old lady right now. <laughs> uh, I've been uh, in bioenergetics for um, many, many years. Uh, so I started my training in 1976. I was certified as a CBT in 1982 and started to uh, be a bioenergetic um, analyst here in Montreal in private practice. Then I started to uh, also work as a supervisor and local trainer around 1987. And then I got accepted as a faculty member, international trainer of the IIBA in 1992. And since then, I um, have been done training in various places, which was such a rich experience for me. So I did train in many uh, provinces in Canada. I did some training in the United States. I trained in France, in Belgium, in Spain, in Russia lately, and also in Argentina for several years and in Brazil as well. And I also did some training in New Zealand. So I feel very fortunate because I feel deeply connected to the international community of bioenergetic analysis. Plus, I was involved in the organization uh, in various ways. I was part of the executive committee uh, in 19, 1996 to 1998, especially at the time when we transformed the International Institute from uh, an institute that was directed uh, by Lowen from New York to uh, an institution where um, the um, uh, the um, uh, directors were elected by the membership, which was very new. And I was involved in many committees, the teaching committee, the faculty committee. So I really feel fortunate to belong to that uh, wonderful community. So I think that's about all that I can say for now. What? is the specificity of bioenergetic analysis compared to other therapeutic modalities, including other forms of body psychotherapy? Yes, well, I always felt that the very specificity of bioenergetic analysis was related to our very particular way of doing character analysis and working with character structure. I don't know that I um, know of any other uh, therapeutic approach, including body uh, therapy approach, uh, that have such a comprehensive approach to the existential struggle of a particular person. Now, that's interesting because the, um, the concept around character structure was developed by Reich and particularly with his principle of functional identity, which was a brilliant concept that, um, that, that, that said that whatever uh, function of the uh, defensive apparatus on the psychic level, it was reflected also on the somatic organization of the person and the way that person was organized somatically and presented her or himself physically, these tensions and these uh, defensive psychological pattern had the same function to defend against a painful experience. So uh, Reich did, did really something brilliant when he brought the body into the therapeutic room and also used it as a very precious tool to understand more deeply the person and also to work with that. Now, Lowen developed uh, from Reich's basic principles 
And uh, he developed his own kind of uh, psychotherapy, which he named bioenergetic analysis. Now, he really built upon what uh, Reich had developed, and he um, became more specific. He developed um, the character types, the five character types, um, and the, uh, the um, schizoid, the oral, the uh, psychopath or narcissist, the masochist, and the rigid. So that was an interesting attempt as uh, helping us understand that the uh, somatic organization and the psychological organization of a person would be different depending on what happened in their lives as they were uh, going through different developmental stages. So if a, um, a little uh, infant right from the start of their lives were rejected by their parents or by their mother, then the way they would organize somatically and psychologically would be very different from when they would develop if, if they encountered um, difficult uh, experiences only when they reached the Oedipal uh, stage, for instance. So um, it, it was interesting to have uh, these, this, this, um, char these character types. Uh, however, when I was uh, trained um, around the, uh, the yes, the uh, years of 1970s and the, the years of the 70s and the uh, beginning of the 80s, unfortunately, the character types were often used to label people. And, yeah. uh, and we would participate actively in that. I remember that as a student, uh, during my own training in the late 70s, we would all want to have our label. What am I? Am I um, a schizoid? Am I a masochist? And, and we would attach uh, a certain value on character structure. Uh, for instance, I remember thinking, oh, the poor schizoid, they're the most damaged. And, and the rigids were the um, the more the, the luckier ones <laughs> because uh, they were supposed to be more evolved. Well, that that doesn't work like this. Um, I myself was labeled a masochist, <laughs> uh, and of course it it fits with uh, some of my own um, life experiences. But it's much more complex than that because later in life, I realized that under the masochist. Uh, layer, there was something pretty much borderline in myself. So um, now we have learned that um, actually uh, we're we're not case um, book uh, cases like we find in books. So we are much more complex. And I remember Lowen having said, "I regret so much to have done the character types because people are using it to label." their patients, and it's not what they should do. They should use it and or, or try to rather, what he would say, see the person. So, okay, so I'm, I'm, that would be my answer to that first question. Character analysis is the specificity of bioenergetic analysis, but it has to be done in a way in which we pay attention to the unicity of um, the person and to the unicity of their existential struggle. And this is what Lowen wanted us to do. Perfect, thank you, Louise. Unfortunately, I think that the most uh, of the bioenergetic students uh, pass to this, this kind of, of vision of the characters. Yes, of course. Right. Well, Actually, us trainers made sure that when we would teach the various uh, character uh, issues uh, or character types or character organization, we made sure that it's not used to label. It's used to try to gain a deeper understanding of some very particular core issues. Perfect. Let's go to the second question. Yeah. Uh, uh, how was bioenergetic analysis 
evolved since the early days when Lowen formulated his character types shirt. Yes, so um, the, the first thing is what I just said, is that we have evolved uh, in a way in which we use character analysis as a way to see the person, to understand the person, and try to deepen our understanding of what is the core issue with that person. Now, what has also evolved is that since uh, Lowen um, uh, developed the, the five character types, we have deepened our understanding of the issues of each character types. And also we added uh, one, um, I wouldn't say one more character types, but um, uh, Lowen never uh, spoke very uh, extensively about the borderline. And, the, and we know how many clients now we have who are struggling with borderline issues. So uh, since, since the beginning of Bioenergetic, I think we have expanded a lot our own understanding about um, the borderline issues and all the other issues of the various character structure. Now, another thing that I think that evolved is that um, in my time at the beginning, the character structure was seen as something that was uh, bad. We had to uh, not break the character structure, but we had to, we, um, well, with Lowen's uh, style of work, he would very rapidly see what the um, nucleus was, and he would go directly for the nucleus, and the character structure was very quickly crumbled when he would work with a person. And so the emphasis was more put on, well, the character structure is something that has to be um, worked with, but in a way to, we have to go to the center. And sometimes it was uh, very quick and the person, uh, it was not easy for the person to recuperate when there was a lot of confrontation. Now, I think nowadays we tend to uh, put more emphasis on uh, what are the resources of the character structure. And we are coming to see and understand more how the character structure is, um, I would say, a marvel in the developmental history of a person, how creative the character structure was to help a person uh, survive uh, various um, painful or threatening situations in their lives. So now we're, we're seeing more the positive aspect of the character structure. And I think we tend to honor, honor more the, um, the process by which we help a person soften their character structure to be able to get to the nucleus inside of themselves. Um, now, another thing that has evolved is also that um, I remember in the early time, I mean, when I was training in the 70s and even the beginning of the 80s, and, and it, it was also Lowen's model. Lowen was exceptional in his capacity to look at a person and to deeply understand what their core issue were. And he would go for it. He, would, he, he always said, I don't want to lose time. I want to help that person be more vibrant, be more alive. And so I will help them get to their core issues quickly. And he worked more um, in a model in which he was somehow the expert. He knew what was the problem. He knew how to get there. He knew how to... Uh, get the person to break down and cry and sob. And uh, it, it was very powerful and he did help. Uh, I see, I seen him the, do uh, very deep work with people and I was really impressed by that and I admired that. And it was a really gift that he had. But now as, as Bioenergetic evolved in the 80s, uh, there was more emphasis put on the importance of the relationship. Uh, 
mm -hmm. and less on uh, the therapist became less of the expert who was able to read the body and know what the problem was and knew how to get there. And it evolved more into how can we establish the relationship so that the patients become more a partner in that work. And the, uh, so the relational aspect of the therapy became uh, more important. Uh, in, the, in, in those times, there were uh, the people from the West Coast of the United States, and I'm thinking about uh, Robert Hilton and other uh, senior uh, trainers uh, who really helped put an emphasis on okay, it's important not to only be the expert, we're not the expert here, but the relational aspect has to be also emphasized, how we relate to the person, how we include the person in their own process. Okay, I think that, that's the answers, uh, the, 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 the changes that I've seen over, over the years. And I will talk more about also uh, I think one of the major change has been also to um, stress the uh, emphasis of uh, the early issues and how to work with the early issues in a different way. So that uh, bioenergetic was very cathartic uh, in the beginning with big uh, explosion of emotions. And then we, we, uh, gradually learn to modulate and and make space for interventions that were softer and that also took into consideration uh, um, early issues and more fragile uh, structures that had to uh, do the work more progressively. Cool, thank you. Is uh, a good upgrade. Uh, in, in this time that our organization started to work with Winnicott terrorists? Well, uh, actually, uh, yes, there were, I, I remember one of uh, my um, mentors and, and uh, dear colleague who uh, is David Campbell. He was a Scottish uh, trainer. Uh, he passed away, unfortunately. He, he had studied with Winnicott, and he also, along with the, those uh, West Coast trainers, uh, he also, in his teaching, was emphasizing um, a, an approach centered on um, being able to modulate and pay attention to uh, uh, all the early issues and the fragility of the people. Did bioenergetic analysis borrow from other perspectives and from the recent developments in psychology? That's right. Yes, yes, that's it. <laughs> um, well, originally, uh, based on Reich's work and also how um, Lowen developed uh, the bioenergetic analysis approach. Uh, it was more centered on the psychosexual development. So the, the emphasis was put on how can we help the patient um, soften their characterological uh, defenses, both on the somatic level and psychological level, so that they can attain uh, a fuller sexual life and, and um, arrive at a developmental place in their lives with uh, sexual primacy. Now, what ha and that, that remains, and that is very important too. But what we gained with the new, um, the, um, the new uh, findings in, uh, in, uh, psycho in the, the psychological movement, the larger psychological movement, was that we were inspired by the work of Bowlby around attachment theory, by the work of Daniel Stern, who put the emphasis on uh, the, the attunement the importance of attunement uh, in early development. Shore, uh, Alan Shore, who put the emphasis on affect regulation. And I would add also Heinz Cohort, 
who developed a very original uh, theory around the, the fact that there were at least, there were two vectors of development. One was the um, object relation development, uh, my relationship to the other, the oral, um, oral anal, a typical phase of development, but he also emphasized another vector of development, which was the narcissistic development, the relationship to oneself, and how can I get mirrored by my parents and develop a sense of myself as a, a worthy person. So, and so he, he discussed a lot about uh, healthy narcissism as opposed to uh, various type of problems uh, around narcissism. So all these authors uh, really brought uh, into perspective, uh, particularly how important um, the early development was. So instead of uh, putting the emphasis only on the psychosexual development and um, having a focus on uh, attaining sexual maturity and potency, which remains a very important objective. But then we devoted much more attention now to also what was happening on the development of the self, the sense of self, uh, the type of early attachment we develop, and also the kind of relationship to our own narcissism. So this, these, all these findings found their ways into our teachings in bioenergetic analysis. So in the, um, in the curriculum that we now teach, we integrate those elements and those concepts. And um, we, uh, we put much more emphasis now on um, the, uh, the, the, uh, what's happening in these early issues and what's happening in the very early developmental stages. Now, the other thing that was also developed is a deeper understanding of uh, the various modalities of um, the therapeutic relationship. Now, these Late years, there was there is also a, a lot of discussions around the various modalities of relationship during a therapeutic session and over a therapeutic process, and we are developing a better understanding. For instance, between what is uh, an analytical relationship to analyze the defenses uh, and to be able to help a person analyze and understand their own defensive organization. Um, we also have a better understanding of uh, the transferential relationship, how we can understand and work with the transference of the, the patient and also our own counter-transference. And this is also an important part of the curriculum when we teach bioenergetic analysis. And a new type of relationship, which is being called the intersubjective relationship. And in the intersubjective relationship, it's very delicate because the, the um, the therapist in that kind of relationship would share their own uh, experience in the relationship with the client. It's a person to person relationship. Now the difference would be like, uh, for example, in an analytical relationship, I would talk in terms of you. This is what I see you doing. This is my understanding of your um, type of functioning. And in an intersubjective relationship, I would share with the patient, oh, this is how I feel when you say that. Oh, uh, I can feel the sadness as you are sharing this with me. And this is a very important type of relationship, especially with people who have preverbal traumatic or micro traumas in their history. 
because uh, they need to have that resonance. They need to have that uh, response, emotional response to what they are sharing because this is precisely what they never got. And so mm. this is why now we're getting to understand better uh, these various levels of therapeutic relationship and understand how to modulate them to address very specific kind of wounds or issues or um, trauma the person may have uh, experienced. So we're much more, um, we, we know much more about how to approach trauma than what was the case at the origin of bioenergetic analysis. What did bioenergetic analysis integrate uh, from neuroscience? Now, this is another very interesting um, dimension um, or, or knowledge, a body of knowledge that we've learned to integrate. Um, we've, we've been inspired, for instance, by the, what's been written uh, about the uh, mirror neurons. And that really has helped us understand much more about um, how empathy works with our, with our patients. Um, and then we also um, uh, could, we were also inspired by the work of Bessel van der Kolk and Stephen Porges. Yes? Uh, so, sorry, if you feel uh, comfortable, uh, I, I was thinking if you can talk a little bit more about uh, mirror neurons. Uh, a I, few words, maybe a few words. Well, I cannot say more. I, I uh, know that uh, the person who um, originally wrote about this is a person named Giacomo Rizzolacci. Um, so he, uh, he was, I think, one of the first ones to... Uh, understand this and the the mirror neurons is is what helps us uh, really feel from the inside what a person may be experiencing it's so empathy is different from sympathy in sympathy if a person is sad well uh, i can become very sad as sad as the person but it doesn't help the person with the mirror neurons and with empathy, what will happen is that I can see that my, my patient is sad, but what will happen is that I will be able to intuit from the inside how it, how it is to experience such a, a sadness. And I will be able to become what I call an emotional echo to that person. And this is a concept I like to teach about, the emotional echo. And it's, it's also a type of intervention that is very different from analysis. In analysis, I would, um, I would say, this is how I understand your functioning. When I'm working with the emotional echo, it's, it's a bit like what I was explaining with the intersubjective uh, relationship. Is for instance, I found out that was very helpful for me when I had patients who had um, severe trauma and who were in a state where they had no words to express yeah. what was happening to them. They yeah. would be sitting on, on, on the, uh, facing me, and I would ask them, um, now, can you tell me what is going on for you? And they would be uh, in touch with such primitive states inside themselves that sometimes they would look at me and say, mm. I have no words. And the only thing I could do then was to try to share with them how I resonated with what I saw. And I would say something like, when I see your, your facial expression, when I see how you are in your body, what I imagine is that 
maybe you inside of you, there is a big storm and you don't know where you are. And I would try to describe what I would into it. Uh, and sometimes they would just say, they would just indicate, yes, mm, doing things. Other times they would say, no, this is not exactly. Uh, it's more like this. And just my resonance would help them uh, put some words, uh, even if I was not on, on the dot, uh, when they would say, it's not exactly like this, it's more like this. It would help them shape a bit, a bit more their experience. And this is what I call emotional resonance. And I think that has to do with the mirror neurons. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I, I, now, I think yeah. that I was feel a emotional resonance now. <laughs> well, I'm glad you do. <laughs> I wanted to ask, uh, to add something about the uh, neuroscience aspect, because I also wanted to talk about... Uh, the contribution of Bessel van der Kolk and Stephen Porges, because they helped us learn so much more about the um, parasympathetic system. And I want to salute also the work of um, uh, David Berselli, who developed the TRE uh, approach to trauma and who was inspired by those authors, and David had been uh, trained in bioenergetic also. And the contributions of these authors helped us understand the functioning of the um, parasympathetic system, which was very enlightening because uh, when I used to teach the um, Reichen concept of sympathetic and parasympathetic system, I would always explain that the sympathetic system is the fight or flight uh, system uh, that activates us when we feel threatened. And the parasympathetic system was oh, the system where that would help us relax and feel um, that we were in an expansive state and so forth. Now, what van der Kolk and Porges helped us understand is that in the parasympathetic system, there is the ventral and the dorsal parasympathetic system. And the ventral uh, parasympathetic system is the one that indeed helps us relax, open up, feel secure, confident, open to others. But that other dimension, which is the dorsal parasympathetic, is the, 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 the system that would activate a traumatic response and would uh, push up to a place where there would be um, emotional flooding, dissociation, freezing re reactions. So uh, their findings really helped us see what was happening with our clients when the, the various systems were activated. And we could understand better how to work with trauma when these traumatic responses were triggered. What to do when um, a person gets emotionally flooded, dissociates, or freezes. And we have learned to help them come to a place where they could self-regulate or uh, we would also learn how to help them stay in the range of um, a window of tolerance where their emotional and somatic response wouldn't be too intense for them so they would uh, get into these places of trauma to re-traumatization. So yeah. that helped us uh, very much. That helped us a lot to learn to work with um, our, our patients who are struggling with trauma. And we, we learned to pay much more attention to self-regulation 
and see how to work. And this is one of the changes of bioenergetics. Uh, in the beginning, bioenergetics was learned, was seen as the, the therapy where you really uh, had cathartic responses. You would, hate, you would hit with the racket, you would scream, you would kick. And of course, I think it's important to keep these um, tools because depending on the situation, on the issue, uh, people need to be able to have these cathartic discharges. But we have learned that we cannot work like that with all our patients, that we need to um, expand our, um, our tools so that we can work in a more subtle way and help people who, has, uh, who have traumatic issues remain in that window of tolerance and capacity for self-regulation. And um, the, the teachings or the uh, theories that uh, were developed by, by Van der Kolk and Porges, and also by other um, therapists who are working with trauma, I'm thinking about Peter Levine, Pat Ogden, uh, also Daniel Siegel, who uh, is working a lot with the mindful brain, the mindful therapist. All these authors have helped us deepen our understanding of the, uh, the traumatic issues and how to work with them. Keeping in touch with our own uh, tools, we're still using our tools, but we're modulating how we can use them depending on the issues. Perfect. <laughs> wow. I suppose and, I, I hope I'm clear. <laughs> yes, very clear. Uh, and talking about this, uh, how can the concept of character analysis continue to be relevant, relevant in the practice of bioenergetic analysis as of today, given the fact that bioenergetic analysis has been integrating more of the recent developments in the field of psychology? Well, I think it is still very relevant, the concept of character structure, because um, we have deepened our understanding of the various core issues related to various character types. We have learned that there is not just one character type. I was giving the example of myself uh, with the masochist layer and finding out later on that I had um, borderline issues as well. So um, it's important to, to, to stay, to keep uh, that, um, uh, um, that character analysis concept and that approach of to try to see the person. And the way I uh, simplify that for my students, instead of um, insisting too much on the character structures, the character types, which I explain, of course, I tell them, when you look at the patients, what you're trying to do is to understand the very specific existential struggle of that person. And the way to do that is to ask yourself two, two questions. And these are simple questions. Ask yourself against what kind of emotion or emotional uh, experience is this person struggling against? That is the wound, the deeper wound. That's the first question. Second question is how is that person defending herself? Again, that painful uh, experience. And that is the character structure. Uh, well, well, how is the second question? How, we... how does that person defend against that wound, against that painful experience? Okay. So you have, at the core, you have the wounded self. The, the part that where I was, I uh, experienced traumatic experiences or painful or uh, threatening experiences, and I learned to defend myself to survive. So against what kind of experience? Is it a very primitive experience? Is it an experience that 
uh, ar arose later in my developmental process or the patient's developmental process. And so I have to try to understand that and then asking how is that person defending herself against that in the way she behaves in the office and in, in what I notice in the, the body. Now, um, what's interesting also, and what I want to emphasize is the importance of associating the person to that process. So body reading to understand the character structure. In doing body reading, I'm not the expert who sees everything, who understands everything, because oftentimes, even after 40 some years of practice, some patients, I, I don't quite understand what they're about, you know? Yeah. Uh, so what's important is to associate that person, to work as a team. So what happens is when I would be doing a body reading and I would, I would see, oh, that person has that stance like a very heroic soldier to have to move on through life, whatever uh, happens. So I would share with them that impression they give me. Oh, for me, you look like a, a soldier and you have no choice but going on and you cannot let down. Does that, does that resonate with you? And uh, so there I would share my perception like a piece of puzzle I would give them or a ball I would, uh, <laughs> I would, a piece of poison. Puzzle. 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 A puzzle. puzzle. Yeah, Quebra cabeça poison. in Portuguese. No, no, yeah, no, yeah. Poison. Sorry. No, no. A puzzle. Puzzle. Uh, rompe cabeças. <laughs> Quebra cabeça in Portuguese. Quebra cabeça. Um, and, uh, or a ball I would uh, send to them. And then they catch the ball and they say, well, yes, that resonates with me. It's like... Uh, I never had the permission to let down. I always had to be the strong one. Or, so that is an example. Or they would say, well, it's a little bit like this, but not exactly. And I, w and I would also share with them, oh, this is what I see also. I see like you're not really breathing or it, it looks as though your, your arms are not really connected to your body. Do you... Does that make, do you feel that? Do you sense that? And then the, the client can respond. And if they say no, then I, I stay with two possibilities. Uh, I may be the one who, who's not understanding them. I may be wrong. The other possibility could be, well, maybe they cannot... Uh, allow themselves to be aware of that right now. So I just keep them behind and I will work with the, what the person acknowledges, what they recognize. Because, um, and this is another uh, very important development in bioenergetic analysis and something that we teach very much these, these last years and, and since many years, we teach uh, the importance of attunement. And attunement is the capacity to be on the same wavelength of this, as the patient so that they feel connected to us. And if I, uh, if I go too quick and if I go with my idea of what is the character structure and I wanna bring them there, I'm not with the person. I'm trying to bring them somewhere. And this is not what uh, we should be doing. We should be with the person, trying to be with them where they are and helping them deepen their understanding of who they are. So when I um, do body work with a person, I will propose an exercise and... And so they will, they will experiment it. And if they don't feel it fits them, I'd say, okay, 
let's try find uh, something else. But I will also work with the resistance. I may also ask a person, okay, why is it that you don't like that exercise? Why is it that you don't feel it fits you? And at least there will be a sense of, okay, no, I, I don't like that. Some, for, for example, hitting with the tennis racket. I remember a patient who would told me, she, I mean, she, was, uh, she came from a country where there had been war when she was a child. And she said, no, I don't want to be violent. I can't do that because uh, it's like being violent and I don't want to be like that. So we can work with that. And I will try to find another way of working with something a bit similar. That in that case, for instance, uh, the person would not want, I mean, working with the racket didn't, didn't fit her experience. But I had her throw a cushion in a, in a motion that is very similar to the, the movement of hitting with the racket. And there, that made sense for her. There, she could really let herself uh, get into the more aggressive stance, and that was meaningful for that person. So, uh, and this is what I wanted to explain about the attunement. How can I just stay uh, on the same wavelength as a person and sometimes wanting to bring them somewhere doesn't help. It's just being with them and trying to move from that place together. Do you see the future of bioenergetic analysis? Well, I don't, I don't know if I have that much to say, but uh, first uh, I would say that looking from the past, looking from how we have adapted uh, bioenergetics and integrated the um, contribution of other um, uh, currents of psychological discoveries, I think uh, we've done a very good job of trying to integrate the best of what other authors, other approaches could offer and trying to integrate that with the basic uh, fun the, the basic the basis of bioenergetic analysis, which is still for me character structure, the understanding character structure is which means for me the understanding of a deep existential struggle of the person and how she struggles with that. Uh, I, I, uh, my um, good friend and colleague, Gita Nella, has done a, a, a great job of trying to, um, to write about the um, theoretical and clinical integration of these new concepts with the basics of bioenergetic analysis and other other colleagues that i um that i know also in europe are doing a great job and we are all trying i think all um all of us from the faculty uh the iiba faculty the international trainers we are all integrating that in the teachings that that we do and because of that, because of that capacity to adapt or to integrate what's the best of the uh, new tendencies in psychology, that gives me a lot of hope for how we will continue to develop. Because I think that this is, we are not ossified. <laughs> I mean, we're not just clinging to our theoretical construct. We're really trying to stay alive and evolve and uh, stay, remain open to what we can learn from other authors, other approaches and, and integrate that. So in the future, I think we will continue to be open to, uh, to integrating whatever new um, concepts or clinical practices that can uh, uh, help us enrich our um, approach. Now, what I also see is how bioenergetic analysis could um, expand beyond just the um, psychotherapeutic um, one person-to-person -person setting. 
I think bioenergetic analysis can have so many applications to the well-being of people. And I'm thinking in particular of how you Brazilians uh, have, um, have a talent and also the um, stamina and the courage and the, the energy to um, try to expand bioenergetic analysis beyond just that setting. I'm thinking of the um, social clinics. Of course, it's still um, a therapeutic setting, but I, it's like I can see how in, in various places there is that uh, desire to try to apply bioenergetic analysis principle and practices to other settings. Uh, I know, I know, it's not just only in Brazil. I think there are many good, um, many, many good. I'm sorry, my phone is ringing. I'm not. I'm going to ignore it. <laughs> um, uh, in many other places in the world, uh, in Europe, in, um, in in various places, there is that intention or desire to. Um, adapt bioenergetic bio analysis to other settings. Because we have students who are, for example, educators, or they're working in other fields like osteopath and uh, other, other kind of uh, professional, um, uh, other kinds of professional settings where they can really apply some of the principles of bioenergetic analysis. And I think that we will uh, discover more and more um, how we can apply it to um, other, uh, other places, other settings. And, uh, and hopefully, I remember Virginia Hilton, who was uh, once the uh, president of the uh, IIBA, she used to say that uh, bioenergetic analysis is the best kept secret in the world. <laughs> okay.